let me know. Oh, yes, you have to circulate this page. Any question about uh, last time? Okay, everything was clear. So last time I started uh, discussing the case of an one charged plane with counter ions. Before that, I, I see that uh, to be complete, I will come back to one thing, which is, uh, so we saw uh, how to derive the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So the Poisson-Boltzmann equation tells you about the distribution of ions uh, in a system at, at thermodynamic equilibrium. But there is an interesting question about uh, transport and about dynamical processes uh, in a solution. How, so what happens, for instance, if you have a current, if you have a flow, if the ions are, are mobile and you are not at equilibrium? And I want to discuss this uh, rapidly just to show you the equation. And it's called the Poisson Nernst Planck equation. So this is really for the dynamics of ions. And uh, I will discuss it in the simplest case where the fluid, you have a steady fluid, which is uh, not mobile, and you have ions in your fluid, plus or minus charges, which are moving in any direction. So this is very relevant to batteries, cell fuels, uh, fuel cells, and, uh, and also to transport of uh, charges uh, through ion channels in biology and things like that. Okay, so the starting point for this is the Langevin equation for the ions. So the ions, I will assume, as usual, that there are NK charges, QK, in the system. And if I look at the equation of motion in a fluid of a charge of type K, so there are, let's say, M species like this, so the equation is given by the Langevin equation. So the Langevin equation is essentially Newton equation, So this is, so Newton equation is just ma acceleration equals the force. Now, you know that when you are in a fluid at a finite temperature, thermal equilibrium, there is a friction and there is a Gaussian noise. Do you, did you see, did you study Langevin equation? Okay, so if you are in a fluid which has a certain viscosity, I will, t I will write the equation for the uh, viscous case for the overdamped case. And the overdamped case is when the mass term is very small compared to the friction term. So I will write the equation in the following way. It's exactly equivalent to this. So I will write the overdamped Langevin equation in the following form. I'll write it as drk by dt equals d beta f rk plus the noise eta k of t. So d is the diffusion coefficient, and it can be dependent on the, num on the particle uh, species, it doesn't matter. So dk is called the diffusion coefficient. And it's related to the friction coefficient gamma k.
by the so-called Einstein relation, which is essentially that gamma k equals 1 over beta dk. Okay, so that's the relation between the friction coefficient and the diffusion coefficient. Yes? Does this F function have to be the same for all k? No, can be... But F, okay, so uh, F is the force. Is the force acting on particle K. Now, we will take, um, we will study ions in a fluid. So essentially what we will take for F is the electrostatic force, the electric force, and so it is the same uh, nature, but at different points, right? But it, it could be, uh, of course, this equation is valid. Uh, each particle has a different force, and the force, of course, can depend on the position of all other particles. Everything is coupled together. But we will see that in the Nernst Planck equation, it's a kind of mean field approximation, a dynamical mean field approximation equivalent to Poisson Boltzmann in the other case. So for the moment, I will assume nothing, just uh, this. Okay. Okay. So you know that when you have, and of course, the noise eta k of t is a noise. It's a white noise, so it's a random. It's a random force. So a random force, which has the following property, that the average of the force is zero. Right, and the variance of the force. Uh, or may, let's say uh, is equal to 2 delta KL dK delta of T minus T prime. So this is really the standard, uh, standard Langevin equation. The noise is a white noise, so it's a Gaussian <coughs> noise. It has a Gaussian distribution probability distribution with zero average and correlation function, which tells you that the noise for particle K and particle L are decoupled because the noise comes, of course, the noise which is here essentially represents the collisions of the particle with the particles of the fluid, with the particle of the solvent. And the noise is not correlated on time, so you have this uh, delta function like this. So this is really classical, I guess, you probably saw this in your classes of uh, statistical physics. So the important point is that this is a stochastic equation, and therefore RK, because it's a stochastic equation because eta is a random noise, it's a stochastic variable, and therefore the position of RK is not uh, really deterministic, it's, it depends on the history of the noise, and therefore you, the, the position of the particle RK is determined by, there is a probability distribution P, probability to find the particle at point RK at time T. And the, this uh, probability distribution function satisfies a Fokker-Planck equation. which is d by dt of p rk t equals or rather than uh, rather than writing it like this I, I will rather write it like this. pk of rt is the probability to find particle of type k at point t so dpk by dt equals d so d index k, d by dr of dpk by dr minus beta fk of rk 
times pk, uh, fk of r. So this is the Fokker-Planck equation. This is classic. Uh, have you have you studied uh, this kind of dynamics, the uh, Langevin equation and uh, Fokker-Planck? Yes. Okay. Good. So this is a kind of diffusion equation. And Fk, so Fk of R is the force acting on particle of, of particle of type K at point R. Yes. Sorry? Uh, so, are we assuming that when you have an ion of type K, yes. that the forces, random forces are only due to fluid, not because of any other ion? Yes. This but that's, uh, that's the standard uh, thing, that, uh, that when you have many different kinds of particles, the, they are not at the same position. So, they, you, know, there is, you assume that there is no correlation in, in distance and in... Uh, it's an assumption that there is no correlation for the noise at different points in space and no correlation of the noise at different uh, times. And I therefore... Time and space is fine for me, but, but KL, I mean... The what? Delta KL. Delta KL between different types of particles. So there is no correlation between particles, uh, between uh, plus ions and minus ions or so, for the noise. It's about the noise. It's not about... Uh, there is no correlation only because... Exactly. No, no. The force, the force. It's an electrostatic force, so it includes all the interactions between all the particles. Okay. But the, but the random noise comes from, uh, from the fluid, from thermal uh, collisions, and therefore, uh, if you have a particle here and a particle here, they feel forces which are uncorrelated. Okay. Sorry. Why? Because it's they it's are, they it's are both in a fluid. yes, but the uh, but they except if they are very close by, mm. if they are at uh, let's say the correlation the noise the distance the correlation distance of the noise is very small. So if your ions are not too concentrated, the typical distance between the ions is much larger in general than the correlation of the noise, the correlation distance of the noise. So, but usually it's a, it's an approximation which is a quite satisfied. Our assumption is that the concentration of noise in fluid is very small, very low, no? The concentration of ions is uh, very low and the correlation of the noise is, uh, is very, very small. Very small compared to the typical distance between the ions. But this is not, it's not a strong assumption. It's, uh, okay. So, so this is now where uh, the approximation come into the game. So in principle, Fk of R is the sum of all uh, Coulomb interaction between the particle K and all the other particles. And this, you make a kind of mean field approximation by, by imagining that Fk of R is Qk, the charge of the particle, times the field Ek at point R, and what you, or the not Ek, E at point R, and what you write is therefore that this is minus Qk gradient phi at point R, and therefore you have this equation, the Fokker-Planck equation, which becomes d by dt Pk of R and T is dk d by dr dpk by dr plus beta qk gradient phi of r pk of r. So this is for the probability distribution function. And this equation is linear, so if I multiply pk by nk, where nk is the number of particles of type k, then 
you have this relation that the concentration of particle of type K at point R time T, that's just NK times PK of R and T. And therefore, you have the equation, which is the Nernst Planck Nernst equation, which is that D C K by D T equals D K. So usually uh, people write it like this as gradient, gradient C K plus beta Q K C K gradient phi. So this, this is the Nernst-Planck equation. It tells you how the concentration of iron varies in time in presence of uh, charges in the fluid, etc. And this equation, of course, has to be supplemented by the Poisson equation. And the Poisson equation is that minus epsilon Laplacian phi with this phi, because of course this equation relates CK to phi. You want another relation to close this, you want an e equation which will relate phi to CK, and the equation which relates phi to CK is just the Poisson equation which tells you that minus epsilon Laplacian phi is the density, the concentration of fixed charges plus sum over k, sum over all charges of qk, ck of r. So this is the second equation. So this closes the set of equation between ck and phi, phi and ck. So, and this set of two equations is called the poisson nernst planck equations. Is it clear? So starting from a certain configuration of charges, CK, so you can assume that uh, you, I don't know, you have a certain uh, electric field, you have a certain initial configuration of charges, and then you can just solve this equation numerically. There are essentially, uh, essentially no analytic cases which are exactly soluble except maybe some uh, trivial cases without, uh, but people use extensively this equation numerically to calculate currents and, and distribution of currents and distribution of ions in uh, ionic fluids uh, which are circulating or ionic liquids. Okay. Yes? So PK of R is the probability to have a particle at point R. Yeah. If you multiply by the total number of particle of this type in the system, that will tell you how many particles of type K, the density of particles of type K at point R, right? If you have the probability, you multiply by nk, that will give you the concentration. The concentration is number of ions per unit volume. Yeah. But the probability it's it's normalized. You see, if this probability, if you integrate it, it's equal to one. If you integrate over R, it should be equal to one. So the concentration is the total number of particles that you have in the system. So, so the probability, if you want, it's, it's one over n, the, con the concentration. Or it. Yeah, it's, a, it's always a density of probability. Yes, of course. When you're in continuous space, when I say probability, it's a probability density, of course, so that uh, the integral of pk of r d3r is one at each time. It's a density of probability. 
And if you multiply by nk, of course, it will be nk. And that's the total concentration of particles of type k at point r. It's the local concentration. Is it clear? Or it's, uh... OK, just uh, so this was just, uh, of course, I cannot, uh, I don't want to, to dig uh, too much into this. It's just uh, because it's an important equation if you happen to work in uh, electrochemistry or if you, or transport uh, in membranes and things like that. Um, just a, a last uh, remark, which I uh, will write here or here, and which is uh, if you are at equilibrium. <clears throat> so this equation, of course, uh, takes the form of a continuity type of equation, which is uh, dck by dt plus divergence of jk equals zero, where the current jk is minus dk times gradient ck plus beta qk ck gradient phi. Okay, so there are arrows everywhere. So this is the, the form of the Nernst-Planck equation. It's really like a continuity equation, a conservation equation. It's the conservation of charge, really. And uh, this equation, if you're at equilibrium, at the thermodynamic equilibrium, then uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, by definition, is that you have no current in the system. So it's jk equals zero. So jk equals zero means dck by dt equals zero, but it's even more general. You, don't, you, you could have a, a constant current, which is a stationary regime, would give you dck by dt equals zero, but thermodynamic equilibrium is really jk equals zero, and jk equals zero is d gradient ck equals minus beta qk ck gradient phi, which you can write if you divide by ck. <coughs> so you can integrate this equation trivially. This is a log of ck. This is minus beta qk gradient phi, uh, minus log minus beta qk phi. <coughs> and since you need a constant of integration, instead of writing ck of r, I write ck over ck zero, where ck zero is a constant. And therefore, the solution, the equilibrium solution for this equation you get back that ck of r is ck0, which is a constant, times e to the minus beta qk phi of r, which is just the Boltzmann distribution for the particle in the field. So this Nernst-Planck equation is consistent with the Boltzmann distribution, and the Boltzmann distribution is the equilibrium solution of the Nernst-Planck equation. Okay. <coughs> no more question. So this equation can be generalized to the case when there is a flow of the fluid. So in other words, if you have, let's say, uh, if the solvent is uh, flowing in a pipe and you have ions inside, so there is a, the, the Nernst-Planck equation takes a more complicated form, which I am not going to discuss, but uh, there is all kind of uh, generalizations of this uh, Nernst-Planck equation. Okay, so this closes, this was just to, to do, to show you how to do mean field theory for uh, ionic fluids in, uh, in mean field theory, the equivalent of Poisson Boltzmann. Yes? Container and the fluid is, I mean, 
moving in the constant velocity at every point, can we expect the solution still to be of Boltzmann time dimension? Uh, no. Then, uh, of course, first of all, there is a, so the, the equation is quite changed because there is a term with the velocity of the fluid which enters explicitly. And uh, usually the, the simpler form is that you give the flow of the fluid. So the fluid is defined by a certain velocity at each point in space. And then you include it in the equation. But, but then the, distribution, the solution is not Boltzmann, of course. Boltzmann is really at equilibrium, thermal equilibrium. Okay, so now I go back to the, uh, what we started last time, which was the planar case. Uh, so can I erase? Yes. Uh, okay. So, so the planar Poisson-Boltzmann equation, as I told you before, so you have a plane here and you assume that it is charged, it is impenetrable, so the ions cannot go through it, and it has a charge sigma, negative charge, could be positive, but I take it negative. And then you can have uh, plus ions, minus ions, which are floating around. So it can be either a salt, but the simplest case that we will start, that we'll study in the beginning, is the case of counter ions. So counter ions is the case where you have only positive ions. No, it's not a salt, it's just ions which are opposite to this. So by definition, counter ions are ions opposite to the object that you're studying. So for instance, if you study polyelectrolytes or polymers, if they are positive, or if you take DNA, DNA is negatively charged, it's a negatively charged polymer. And uh, when it is surrounded by uh, protons, by H+, it's uh, H+, plus are the counter ions. Okay, so if we write the Poisson-Boltzmann equation for counter ions only, the equation takes the form Laplacian phi or minus Laplacian phi equal rho F over epsilon plus, so I will call it uh, C0 E over epsilon E to the minus beta E Phi. There is only one species of ion, and uh, C0 is some constant. Okay, so so the first thing, of course, if we have only counter ions. If we have only counter ions, the, what we see is that here you have a certain amount of charges on the surface. So if you have charge neutrality, it means that here you will have the same amount of uh, counter ions to neutralize so that the total charge of the system is zero. As a consequence, it turns out that at infinity, C of, so C plus, if I write C plus the count of R, is equal to zero when R goes to infinity. Because if it went to a finite value, then by integrating C of R over, if it went to a, a certain C zero, then if you integrate integral C plus of R D3R, this would be proportional to the volume and therefore it, it would be much larger than what you have on the surface. So just, right, so this is just uh, but we will see it anyway, just to show you that as a result, if the C goes to zero at infinity, it means that phi 
must go to plus infinity at infinity, which is unusual. As I said, most of the time in a system at infinity, phi goes to zero. But this is when the solution is neutral. But here the solution is not neutral. You have only counter ions, so you have plus ions. And therefore, it's a different system. And we will see uh, what happens. OK. So just to announce what happens. So as I said before, if you look at this equation. Sorry. Yes? Uh, the fact that phi goes to infinity. OK, so you understand that the concentration of counter ion has to go to zero at infinity. It cannot go to a constant, because if it went to a constant, when you integrate, you would, it would essentially, if, if it went to a finite uh, value, essentially at the end, this would behave like V C zero, or something like that. And V is much larger, the volume, it's the area so it's the area of this, if you want, times a certain distance. So this would be, and the distance uh, L goes to infinity. So this would be much larger than the sigma A, uh, the, than the total charge that you have on the wall. You agree on that? So C at infinity, C must, be, must go to zero. But if, but C, if you remember, C is directly proportional to e to the minus beta e phi. So if it goes to zero, then it means that phi must go to infinity. That's all. But we will see that uh, phi indeed goes to zero, to infinity. At, okay. Okay. So because of the symmetry of the problem, so I will call this Z, of course, and X, Y. So this is a plane, really. And x, y are the two directions in the plane, if you want. So this can be x or y, sorry, x, y, z. And this is only a function of z. And rho f of x, y, z is just sigma delta of z. So the Poisson-Boltzmann equation becomes a normal ordinary differential equation, which is minus d2 phi by dz square equals sigma over epsilon delta of z plus c0 e over epsilon e to the minus beta e phi of z. Okay? And the boundary condition here, you obtain it by integrating this equation between two points which are very close to the wall, one on the left, but on this side you have phi equal, phi prime equals zero. The, the electric field on this side, this is a metal for instance, this uh, or whatever you want, but inside it's at equilibrium, so the electric field inside is zero. And so you have, if you integrate here between, uh, let's say, minus A and plus A, and you, tell, you let A go to zero. So if you integrate, this will give you minus phi prime of A minus phi prime of minus A equals, so the integral of this is sigma over epsilon. And this is of order A. So when A goes to zero, it's very small. And we have the boundary condition, which is, so this is zero. So I write it here. So the boundary condition, so the equation, I can write the equation as minus phi second, let's say. And I forget about this because this is just a boundary condition term. So it's minus phi second equals C0 e over epsilon e to the minus beta e phi of z. And the boundary condition is, so this term is zero, so it's minus phi prime of a. So phi prime of a, of, so and a goes to zero, is phi prime of zero on the right side equals 
minus sigma over epsilon. Okay, so at this stage you can do the integration uh, very easily by, uh, so you multiply both sides by phi prime. So phi prime phi second is the derivative of phi prime square over two. So you can write that d minus d by dz phi prime square over two. Okay. The derivative of phi prime square over two is phi prime phi second. And equals C zero E over epsilon. So you multiply by phi prime. So phi prime e to the minus beta e phi of t. This is minus one over beta e d by dz of e to the minus beta e phi. So minus beta over e, so it's a C zero over beta epsilon d by dz of e to the minus beta e phi of z. Okay. So this equation can be integrated trivially to give minus phi prime square over two equals C zero over beta epsilon e to the minus beta e phi of z plus a constant. Now the constant is uh, quite simple because if you go to infinity, if the system is uh, stable at infinity, so it means that the electric field at infinity should be zero. Now we saw that at infinity you cannot have charges at infinity, so this is the density of charges, at the concentration of charges at infinity, so it's also zero plus A, which means that A is equal to zero. Uh, there is something which is a bit weird because this is a bit uh, negative. Ah, I forgot the minus sign. I forgot the minus sign uh, here because uh, that was a bit uh, annoying. So there is a minus sign here and therefore we have this relation which becomes that phi prime equals square root of two C zero over beta epsilon e to the minus beta e over two phi. Okay? And when you have this kind of equation, you know that you write equals d phi by dz. And so you write d phi on one side. I mean, okay. So I give you the solution. Right, you, you just write this as a <laughs> dz square root of two C zero over beta epsilon dz equals e to the beta e over two phi d phi. So equals two over beta e d of e to the beta e phi over two. And sorry, was okay? And so you can again integrate it. Uh, I will just, okay, so we have the boundary condition here. So you integrate the equation and the solution is just square root of two C zero over beta epsilon times Z minus Z zero, let's say, equals two over beta E exponential beta E phi over two. Uh, there is a, I just, 
question? No, okay. I just realized there is something which is a bit uh, annoying in the notations that E is the electronic charge, but it's also the exponential. Uh, the E which is here is not the same as this one. Be careful. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So when you print, when it's printed, uh, this one, this one is in Roman character, whereas this one are italic because it's mathematical character. But I, I cannot do that on the blackboard. Okay. And um, okay. So this is the equation which gives me. So if I put everything back, so e to the beta e phi over 2 equals square root of beta e square c0 over 2 epsilon uh, times z minus z0. And I remind you uh, what we define as the Birum length is beta e square over 4 pi epsilon. So beta e square over epsilon is 4 pi s is 4 pi lb. So this is just square root of 4 pi lb over 2. So it's 2 pi lb c0 z minus z0. And which gives you that uh, beta e phi over 2 equals 1 half log 2 pi lb c0 plus log z minus z0. OK, so. Now, if I want to apply the boundary condition, so, or I, I'll write it as beta e phi equals this plus twice. Now, the boundary condition, so there are two things to determine. The first thing, so I write that beta e phi prime is equal to 2 over z minus z0. And if I go at here. So this will imply that beta e, if I, I go at, phi, at z equals 0, so I get beta e phi prime of 0, which is minus sigma over epsilon beta e <laughs> equals minus 2 over z 0. So that gives me that z0 is equal to epsilon to 2, sorry, 2 epsilon over beta sigma e. And therefore, it is negative because I remind you that sigma is negative. So it's minus 2 epsilon over beta sigma e. So this quantity z0, uh, sorry, with a, OK? It's just a matching of a boundary condition. So I define a quantity which is called lambda g, which is the GUI Chapman length. from the name of the two physicists who found this solution of the planar, uh, of the planar case. So the gui chapman length is given. So this z0 is a length, of course, because it's a z minus z0. So it's homogeneous to a length. And this length, lambda g, is equal to 2 epsilon over beta sigma 
Yes. This one. Yes. yes. You bring this by integrating from theta zero to theta. No, I just say that when I have this, this is a differential. So I can integrate, yes, between whatever you want and whatever you want. So there is a constant if you want. The the integral of this is z is square root of this plus a constant. So the constant I call I write it in this form, that's all. Yes, because uh, there is only one constant in the end. Okay, uh, first of all, you will see it here already because that's the solution, right? Whatever Z0 is, you see that when Z goes to infinity, the potential phi will go uh, exponential, will go logarithmically to infinity. Uh, to, yes, phi goes to infinity when Z goes to infinity. The reason, the physical reason, as I say, is that this is essentially proportional to the concentration of ion of counter ions at point Z. And this concentration of must go to zero when Z goes to infinity because you want, you see, you have minus charges and you want to neutralize exactly this. So you, you see, if you have a salt with plus or min and minus charges, then you can have a finite concentration of salt at infinity because the salt is neutral. So there is the, you see the charge we will see that when you have a salt in the solution, you can have, you can attract the plus ions around here. You have the minus, and then at infinity, you have plus and minus, and you can have a finite concentration of plus and minus. So you have a finite bulk concentration of salt when you go far away. But if it's pure counter ions as it is here, necessarily it has to go to and zero. The, the negative ions attract the positive ions. Yes, exactly. And So the potential at infinity in the case of counter ion is just because you, you attract to the wall only the necessary quantity to neutralize the surface charge and then uh, you cannot have uh, steel ions, no. right? Exactly. The, yes, because uh, I think no, it's not infinite. It's not zero. It's the concentration is zero. The concentration of counter ions is zero. So it's not possible to say that, at, for example, the potential B is zero at infinity, no. and then it decreases. It becomes negative. No, because if it was zero at infinity the concentration of ion would be finite. The concentration of counter ions would be finite and that's not possible. Okay. Because you would have uh, too much. You cannot, uh, you see? You cannot compensate. No, this is yeah. you, if you have a salt, it's different because in a salt you have plus and minus in the solution. So they compensate each other exactly. So you have no excess charge, right? At infinity, if you go locally at infinity, the concentration of charge is zero in a salt. But if you are in a, cons in a counter- the, the only problem that I have is, is because the potential can be computed by summing of the pairwise potentials. Yes. And since in, at the infinity, there are uh, always uh, less particles. Yes. One can think that you have a sum of one over r potentials, yes. and so but they, at infinity, the distances between uh, particles yes. increases, so it becomes zero. Yes, and but if you, if you want to say that a particle tends to go to a larger potential, to a less, uh, to a, uh, smaller potential, then you can say zero and minus one minus two. No, but uh, the point is that you see what you say is, if you take the function one over x, for instance, the integral of one over one over x goes to zero at infinity, but the integral diverges, and the integral it diverges how, how, much how far you go to yeah. to zero. So this is exactly the case where the potential doesn't decrease fast enough. So the okay. 
uh, and actually, so this is it. And so the potential uh, takes the form that beta E phi is equal to log, I, rent, I write it as Z. So minus Z zero is this lambda G, right? From this. So Z plus lambda G uh, times uh, plus log 2 pi LB C0. Yes? Yes, I will come to that uh, very soon. Yes, so this length actually, the physical meaning of this length is, we will see. Uh, just a second, I'm looking at one thing. So I'll come back to this, uh, to this length in a minute. So the solution is this. And therefore, if we look at the concentration of, uh, of ions, of counter ions as a function of Z, so the concentration C of Z is equal to C0 E to the minus beta E phi. And you see that is equal to C0 and e to the minus beta, uh, sorry, I, I made a mistake. There is a factor uh, of two, which I forgot, right? I forgot this factor of two. Beta e phi is log of this plus two log z minus z zero. So it's c zero and e to the minus beta e phi is e to the minus log of two pi LB C zero minus two log Z minus Z zero. And the exponential of a log is a function itself. So C zero log exponential log like this, so it's C0 divided by 2 pi LB C0, so it's 1 over 2 pi LB C of Z, and this is 1, uh, and Z, Z0 is, I, I write it, I say it's plus lambda G, so 1 over Z plus lambda G square. So this is the ionic profile of the charges near the wall. Yes? yes. From the equation from the potential. Yes, this one. I, I agree, right, that no matter how few uh, positive charges you put, nevertheless, you get a, um, a positive potential at plus infinity. Is, is it right? I mean, it's like. What do you mean, as? I mean, if you put a very low concentration of positive ions, you still get a, a, a potential that. So, yes. So, in fact, yes? Is that right? No. It turns out that the system will always, uh, the system will put as much counter ions as necessary to neutralize. We will see, you see that the concentration which is here doesn't depend on C0. Okay. It's totally independent on C0. And the reason is, uh, in fact, if you take the poisson boltzmann equation, initially it was phi second equal over epsilon, let's say, equals, uh, what was it, C0 e to the minus beta e phi, right? And you see that I can, and with the boundary condition, which was uh, phi prime of zero equals uh, uh, minus sigma over epsilon. 
So you see that I can include this C0 if I redefine, if I redefine phi, okay, if I re write beta e psi equals beta e phi uh, minus log C0. So it's just a shift in phi, right? I define this new psi. So you see that the equation for psi would be minus psi second over epsilon equals e to the minus beta e psi. Right, I absorb the phi, the zero. And the equation here would be psi prime of zero equals minus sigma of epsilon over epsilon. Which means that the quantity C0 is totally irrelevant in the problem. And the system, so it's not, you see C0 in the way we introduce it in uh, the, the reason, the way we introduced the C0 was I said that the, it's e to the minus beta e phi divided by integral if you remember And I say that if phi goes to, inf to zero at infinity, this quantity is the volume, and there was a factor of n, and that's how the, the concentration came, the C0 came into the game. But here, this integral, as we'll see, this integral is finite, it's a number, it doesn't diverge like V. So, which means that what happens is that the system adjusts the number of counter ions so that it is a, uh, the only way that this whole thing has a meaning is the, when the system is completely neutral, in which case C0 is complete, it's just a constant, it's just a reference point for the potential. Completely neutral means that there's such, uh, such so many charges in the border. Yes, the yes, and we will check that it works. We'll check it immediately. And this C0, you see that, for instance, C0, comes into the, so the potential, I, I write the, the potential, uh, the potential is phi of z equal, so beta e phi, uh, mean beta e phi is the dimensionless potential, is equal to log 2 pi lb c0 plus 2 log z plus lambda g, okay? So you see that the C0 enters, doesn't enter at all in the concentration of ions. It enters here in the, it's just a reference point for the potential. You know that the potential, the value of the electrostatic potential depends on a constant because what's defined is the electric field. So C0 is just a constant which, which defines the origin of potential. So, now uh, one thing I want to show you is uh, what happens, uh, that what is the integral of, uh, okay. So if, if I call uh, sigma the charge here, if A is the area of this surface, then the total charge of my plate is uh, sigma A. I mean, it's negative, but it's uh, modulus of sigma a. So let me calculate some from zero to infinity. So the total number of counter ions is a times, that's the, because it's uh, uniform in the transverse direction, sum from zero to infinity, dz, c of z. So it's a over two pi lb, sum from zero to infinity dz, one over z plus lambda g square. So this integral, the primitive is one over z, it's minus one over z plus lambda g. So it's a, the area times one over two pi lb lambda g. And uh, so, one over, so what is two pi LB lambda G is two pi LB and lambda G, 
So LB is beta e square over 4 pi, and lambda g is 2 epsilon, sorry, yes, beta e square over 4 pi epsilon, and times 2 epsilon over beta sigma e. So you do the calculation, so the 2 times 2 pi and the 4 pi go away, the epsilon goes away, the beta go away, and, uh, okay, the e's go away. I mean, okay, there is a convention of uh, whether it's the density is sigma or sigma e. So I, anyway, you can see that what you get is that essentially this is equal to, uh, so it's the inverse, so it's A times sigma. Uh, A times sigma over E. Okay? And sigma over E is the number of charge, this quantity is the total number of charges on the surface. This is the total charge of the surface, so if you want to know how many charges you have of the surface, it's sigma A over E. So you see that the total number of ion, of counter ions in the system, which are bound in the system, are exactly the number of charges on the surface. Is it clear? Right, the integral of the constant, so the, the integral of the concentration gives you the total number of counter ions in the system. And the total number of counter ions of the system is the surface area A times sigma over E. That's from the integral. And now if you have a surface with a charge, surface charge sigma, the total charge is sigma A. And if you want the total number of charges, it's sigma A over E. So it matches. So that's the first thing. And the second thing which I want to show you is uh, which will help in the interpretation of uh, the of this uh, Guit Chapman link. Yes? Did we assume in the beginning that this that the solution is in neutral? Yes. Uh, I mean, well, in fact, total zero, the right? total charge is zero, but it does it automatically. I mean, it's interesting because we, did, we, we, we control the concentration. No, you don't. When it's counter ions, you cannot control the concentration because you don't have a reservoir. When you have a salt, you can control the concentration because, it, because, it's, uh, at, because in the bulk it is neutral. But counter ions, you have no control. Counter ions are released by the charged object. And the, ob the charge object will release the amount of counter ions necessary to neutralize the solution. It's a big difference between counter ions and uh, salt. And uh, we will see that the solution and the, the physics is complete. For instance, in the cylindrical case, it's completely different. And here also, actually. And the last thing I want to show you, so is if I, that I want to show you is that the, uh, the Guit-Chapman length, so this lambda g, is the length over which half of the, half of the counter ions are present. In other words, if this is your wall, if this is lambda g, so here the total number of counter ions is half of the total number of counter ions in the solution. The way to see it is just that you integrate this concentration instead of integrating it from zero to infinity. If you integrate it to lambda g, c of z, so it's one over two pi lb sum from zero to lambda g dz one over z plus lambda g square. And so it's 1 over 2 pi Lb times 1 over, so the, the integral is just 1 over z plus lambda g. And so it's 1 over lambda g 
minus 1 over 2 lambda g. So it's 1 over 2 pi lb times 1 over 2 lambda g. So you see that if it was 1 over 2 pi lb lambda g, it was neutralizing the whole surface. So here it's 1 over 2 pi lb times 1 over 2 lambda g. So it's neutralizing half of the surface, which means that half of the counter ions are contained in a layer of thickness lambda g. And that's the physical interpretation of this lambda g. Another interpretation of the lambda g is uh, it's the distance at which, so lambda g, half of the counter ions are uh, absorbed, let's say. Right, the half of the total number of counter ions or half of the total charge is neutralized. It's also lambda g is such that the Lb over lambda g, so Lb over lambda g is essentially the Coulomb energy at distance lambda g from the wall. And this is equal to kT. So it's the distance from the wall at which the Coulomb energy is equal to kT. These are the two interpretations you can give of this lambda g. Okay. Yes. So, sorry. Half. Half of the counter ions are absorbed. So half of them over a distance lambda g, half of the counter ions of the total number of counter ions are present and neutralize half of the charge of the wall. It's also the distance at which the Coulomb energy times beta, of course, is equal to kT. Lambda. Uh, no. Okay. No. Sorry. You, you don't write it like this. Yes. Uh, e square. Okay. Okay. So this is it for the for the case of uh, of counter ions. So now I will discuss uh, another important case, which is still the planar case, but now with salt. So if you have salt, so it means you have your negative thing, you have plus and minus charges. I will assume that it's a, a valence one salt. So the boundary condition will be the same if sigma is the if sigma is the charge density on the wall, you have phi prime of zero equals minus sigma over epsilon. That's the same boundary condition as we had before because uh, there is nothing changed. And the equation will be phi second of z 
equals to C0 over epsilon, C0 E over epsilon, sinh beta E phi. Okay, so now C0 is really the concentration, the b so the big difference with counter ions is that here at infinity you can have salt because salt is neutral globally. So if you integrate the charge up to infinity, it's okay because the, the, if you go far from the wall, here you have still plus and minus ions, so the total charge locally is zero. So it doesn't matter. And, uh, and C0, in that case, is really the bulk concentration of the salt far away from the wall. Okay, so you can work out the solution as in the previous case by, uh, by uh, looking for, uh, you know, whenever you have a, in 1D, so it's all still one-dimensional, one whenever you have something like that, you multiply by phi prime on both sides and then you integrate that's the standard method, so I'm not going to do it. I just show you the shape, the form of the solution. So the solution is a bit more complicated than in the previous case. It's minus 2 over beta E log 1 plus gamma E to the minus Z over lambda E divided by 1 minus gamma e to the minus z over lambda d. <coughs> this is the solution where lambda d is the Debye-Huckel, uh, the Debye length. Okay, and gamma is some constant and I will show you. So, as an exercise, I don't uh, do it because it's uh, quite lengthy to do it, but uh, you can do it, uh, I think it's this afternoon if you have time. Just plug it in here and check that it works. It's, it's a few lines of calculation, but I, I'm not uh, very eager to do it now. So actually, you can write it as you can put as minus 2 over beta e log of e to the z over lambda d plus gamma divided by e to the z over lambda d minus gamma. And if you write it like this, you see that so now I will try to satisfy the boundary condition. So phi prime of z is minus 2 over beta epsilon. And if I take the derivative of this with respect to z, so I write it as log of the numerator minus log of the denominator. So I get 1, so I get a factor of e to the z over lambda d times 1 over lambda d and then 1 over e to the z over lambda d plus gamma minus 1 over e to the z over lambda d minus gamma. And if I write it at z equals 0, I have the boundary condition, which is that minus sigma over epsilon equals minus 2 over beta epsilon lambda d times 1 over 1 plus gamma minus 1 over 1 minus gamma. By just putting z equals 0. Yes? Could you repeat please what is p? What is? P? p? Yeah. Uh, did I write a p? <laughs> 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 
You mean D, maybe? D? It's a gamma, gamma. Ah, it's, a, it's gamma. It's a constant. It, it's, a, it's a constant which is to be determined by the boundary condition. What I, show, what I write is, here is that the general solution has this form with a, a certain gamma, and this gamma will be determined by this boundary condition, which is this relation which I write here. Okay, so you write a plus, plus, okay. So there is some, uh, a little bit of algebra. I, Okay. And this is minus two over beta epsilon lambda d times so uh, uh, have a sign mistake somewhere. Okay, so here it seems that I have minus two gamma over one minus gamma square. Okay, so okay. So if I redefine, so I remind you that lambda g was two epsilon over beta sigma e, then you can work this out and you see that if you define lambda, capital lambda, equals lambda g over lambda d. So the Gui Chapman length divided by the Debye length. So the Debye length is the, essentially the screening length. And you can see that indeed it is a screening length between, because it is the range over which the potential varies. So essentially you can see that gamma satisfies a second order, a second degree equation, which is gamma square <coughs> plus two gamma lambda equals one. And the solution is therefore, so you get gamma equals minus lambda plus square root of lambda square plus one. Okay. So as a consequence, the concentration of plus or minus ions at point like this is equal to C zero E to the minus plus beta E phi. And if I take the expression for phi, which is here, you get that it is C zero one plus or minus E to the minus Z over lambda d divided by one over minus plus e to the minus z over lambda d to the square. So if you look now, so this is what you get by just replacing phi with the value of gamma that you get from there in the, in the problem. 
Okay, so if I look at the profile as a function of z, of course you see that when z goes to infinity, which means when z is much larger than lambda d, the exponentials decay to zero, and then c plus or minus of z is just equal to c zero. So the concentration of positive and negative ion both converge to the same value, to the same bulk value, which is C0, and this is just charge neutrality. This is why uh, you can have the potential going. To, so you see that when Z goes to infinity, the potential goes to zero this time, right? Because this term goes to zero, this term goes to zero, so you have log one. So at infinity, you have zero potential. The potential goes to zero and you go to a finite concentration, which is the salt concentration in the system. Now, if you look at the plus concentration, so there is a certain C0 like this. And of course, so the wall is charged negatively, so you will see that this is uh, C plus and C minus. I mean the so there is an attraction of the salt of the counter ions of the ions opposite of the positive ions are attracted to the wall and then at infinity they go to this bulk value C0 whereas the co-ions which have the same sign the negative ions are repelled from the wall and uh, go to the same C0 at infinity. So the total charge by the salt is not zero? The total charge of the salt? The salt is not zero. Why? I mean, um, it should be, isn't it the, the But one is plus, the other one is minus. Are we, so, sorry, I, maybe I didn't understand. This is not the plot of concentration? Sorry? Is that the, the plot of concentration of plus charge, so minus charge? Yes. Yes. So I guess that the total charge is the integral of one score minus the other. Yes, and the difference is exactly the charge of the surface. Okay. Because okay. the total system has to be neutral. Okay. So since you have an excess of negative charge on the surface, you must have an excess of positive charge in the bulk. And it's over a finite distance only, so as to compensate exactly what you have on the surface. So again, we are solving kind of a special case. Why? I, I guess that I can make a wall, put it some potential tears there, and put some kind of salt, so just to have the same amount of positive and negative charge. Uh, of the salt? I mean, I, I mean, I can define an experiment that I was, that this is exactly the, the same question as before. I, I thought that you can buy a glass, put a, a metal wall in it, mm -hmm. connect it to a battery, and put salt. Mm -hmm. Same amount of positive and negative charge. Yes. So, so this problem cannot be solved here, or, or, is, or is it? No, you, no, okay. You cannot have a system with a macroscopic uh, charge imbalance, with a macroscopic charge. This okay. is not possible. It's not possible? It's not possible because, because of the nature of the Coulomb interaction. Because if you have, let's say, a, a excess of charge, which is Ne, in a solution. If you have a solution which is not neutral with a charge Ne, then the total energy of this, the Coulombic energy of this, would go like N square E square. And this is not, uh, this is huge, so the system cannot exist. There, yes, for an infinite size, of course. For a small system, you can have charge imbalance, uh, this occurs very often, but in a macroscopic system, it's impossible to have non-neutral systems. They would just uh, blow up and uh, right. it's not possible. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, yes? Uh, for C minus and C plus at zero equals to, uh, at Z equals to zero. <laughs> they go to a finite value, which is, uh, which is C zero e to the minus or plus beta e phi of zero. 
and phi of zero is just uh, minus two beta e, so you, you just put uh, z equals zero, so it's log one of plus gamma divided by log one minus gamma. It's just a number. What is the Sorry? Uh, so this is a mistake. Oh, this is, um, yes, okay, it's a mistake because I forgot the gamma. I forgot in, a, let me see, yes, I think I forgot the value, yes, I forgot the value of gamma. Um, yes, you see there is this gamma here, so the when you take e to the minus beta e phi, it's, yes, it's one plus, sorry, there is gamma. Okay, thanks. So it's one plus gamma over one minus gamma or one minus gamma over one plus gamma, sorry. And gamma being the solution of this equation. Okay, so this is planar solution with, uh, with salt. And okay, so now uh, to conclude, I will do, uh, I will discuss one case before discussing the, the cylindrical case, which is very interesting, which we'll see next time. I will go back to a simpler case, which is the planar Poisson-Boltzmann, but now with two plates. So imagine that you have two symmetric plates with salt in the middle. So. So this is the origin, here is L over two, this is minus L over two. So in the case of pure counter ions, you can solve exactly the system. In the case of salt, when you have two symmetric plates, so symmetric means that you have the same charge density here on both sides. The non-symmetric case is much more complicated and I will not discuss it. And the symmetric case, I will discuss it only in the Poisson-Boltzmann approximation. So just one thing I want to say, with counter ions, you can, have, you can solve exactly the problem. It's not very complicated. In the case of salt, you cannot have an explicit analytic solution. You can express it in terms of, uh, of uh, elliptic, elliptic functions. It's a bit complicated and I will not discuss it. So I will discuss what happens with salt in the debye huckel approximation. Is there any question about uh, the previous thing before I start this? I mean, for the other case, you have to work out the solution by yourself if you're interested and see how it works. It's quite easy, but uh, the calculations are, I mean, you have to do it yourself. So the debye huckel approximation for that. So actually, um, if you write the symmetric two-plate case. So, the the Huckel equation is just phi second of z minus kappa d, so in fact it's minus phi second square plus kappa d square phi of z equals sigma over epsilon delta of z minus L over two.
So the charge density is delta of z minus L over 2 plus delta of z plus L over 2. Sorry? Yes? What do you mean exactly by non-symmetrical case? Non-symmetric case is when you would have sigma and sigma prime, two different charge densities on the two plates. Here, the symmetric case is you have exactly the same charge density on both, on both uh, sides. So, uh, the boundary conditions are very simple. Again, you have phi prime of zero equals minus sigma over epsilon. That's the electric field near the wall. And, no, not on zero, on the, let's say on L over two, L over two. And obviously in the center at prime zero by symmetry, phi prime of zero is equal to zero. So we can study, so the system is completely symmetric with respect to zero. And we can study it between zero and plus infinity with this boundary condition. And the equation is just minus phi second of z. So phi second of z equals kappa square phi of z, where kappa d square is the Debye, -Huckel, the Debye constant to the square. So the solution of this is, of course, a, a linear combination. So phi of z is a, a cosh kappa d z plus b sinh kappa d z. If I take a derivative, I get a, a sinh for this and a cosh for this. And if I write the boundary condition that the derivative should be zero at zero, it means that this term doesn't exist. So this is the solution. Right, it's uh, trivial. And then uh, if I write, so phi prime is equal to kappa d a sinh kappa d Z. So the boundary condition is just that minus sigma over epsilon equals kappa d A sinh kappa d L over 2. So this gives me A, and this minus sigma is the absolute value of sigma because uh, sigma is negative. So I have phi of z equals A, so it's sigma over epsilon kappa d sinh kappa d z divided by sinh uh, no, cosh, it's A, so it's cosh, kappa D, divided by sinh kappa D, L over 2. Okay, so that's very simple. And you can calculate the profile of uh, all species uh, around there. Okay, so th the last thing I want to do is to calculate, so when you have these two plates like this, to calculate what is the osmotic pressure of the ions between the two plates. So what is the pressure that the ions are exerting on the two plates? 
So for that, if you remember, we saw that the free energy F in the dubai huckel case is just the, so it's just the integral between minus L over 2 plus L over 2. So there will be a factor of A, which is where A is the area of this, because it's an integral D3R in the whole volume. So it's A, the surface times the integral DF, times DZ, times phi prime square plus kappa d square phi square times epsilon over 2. Okay? So the A is just the surface. And you know that uh, the pressure, the osmotic pressure is related to the free energy by the relation that the pressure, osmotic pressure, is given by minus dF by dV, like the pressure is given by minus dF dV. The, the, and in this case, it's just minus 1 over A dF by dL, where L is the distance between the two plates. OK, so we have f of z here. So f phi prime is sigma over epsilon kd times kd sinh kappa d z over sinh kappa d l over 2. So this is just, so f over a equals epsilon over 2. Uh, the, since everything is symmetric, there is a factor of 2. So it's 2 times sum from 0 to l over 2 dz of. So phi prime square. I will have this and this, so it will be, yes? Sorry, F is free energy. It's the free energy in the dubai huckel approximation. Right, uh, we saw that uh, last time. It's, this is the, the first term is really the electrostatic energy because this is E square, if you want, it's epsilon E square over two. And the second term is the expansion of the entropy. Uh, that's the result of the expansion of the entropy. That's, that's the final result which you see, you can see easily it's uh, given by this. So, uh, so there are some prefactors which are sigma square over epsilon kappa d square, and then it's phi prime square, so it gives a kappa d square plus kappa d square, so it's like this, so 1 over sinh square kappa d L over 2 times cosh square kappa d z plus sin square kappa d z. And so the free energy per unit area, F over A, is equal to epsilon. So the kappa d square will disappear. So it's epsilon over epsilon square, so it's sigma square over epsilon one over sinh square kappa L over two. Yes, and sum. 
from 0 to L over 2, dz. And the cosh square plus sin square is the cosh of twice of 2 kappa dz. So it's sigma square over epsilon sin square kappa L over 2 times, so the integral is 1 over 2 kappa d times sinh two kappa d l over two, so it's kappa d times l. And therefore, you have the final result. So if you remember that sinh kappa d l is twice sinh kappa d l over 2 times cosh kappa d l over 2, you get that phi f over a equals sigma square over epsilon kappa d times cosh kappa d l over 2 divided by sinh kappa d L over 2. It's a fairly simple expression for the free energy of a salt between two plates in the De Bayhuckel approximation. So this is the cotangent. And if you take minus d by dl of f over a, according to this. So, pi is equal to sigma square over epsilon kappa d. And then the derivative of this with respect to l will give me of kappa d over 2 times 1 minus cosh kappa d l over 2 divided by sinh kappa d l over 2 to the square. And therefore, pi is just equal uh, with a minus sign, right? Minus d by dl gives you this. And so the result is pi equals sigma square over 2 epsilon 1 over sinh square kappa d L over 2. And this is the final result. Okay, so now if you, so the pressure is positive, of course, and we can study two regimes. So it goes like, so first of all, it goes like sigma square, so which means that the pressure doesn't depend on the sign of the charges on the two walls. The walls can be, if they are both positive or negatively charged, it's the same. And you see that if you are in the regime where kappa d L much smaller than 1, which means that L much smaller than lambda d, so if, if the distance between the two walls is much smaller than the Debye the length, you see that the pressure pi essentially is sigma square over epsilon lambda d square over L square. So the pressure shoots up like 1 over L square. So where you, when you try to press together at distances 
shorter than the device length, there is a very strong electrostatic pressure which prevents to uh, push the plates together. On the other hand, if kappa d L is much larger than one, then the cinch kappa d L over two is essentially one half of E to the kappa d L over two. And therefore, the pressure scales like sigma square over epsilon E to the minus kappa d L. Right, inch square, and there is a factor of two. So the pressure goes to zero exponentially fast with the distance. So essentially, when you are beyond the Debye Huckel length, there is essentially no more pressure between the plates because the charges are completely neutralized and the plates essentially don't see each other. Uh, so here it goes to infinity, and here it goes to zero. So it goes like this, something like this. Okay, and I think I will stop here. Yes? Uh, why do you name this pressure as uh, osmotic pressure? Because the osmosis pressure that you can find that first it, it was the first surface. It's the pressure which is due to the ions in the system. It's if like, you know, when you define the pressure of a gas in a container, it's the pressure due to the, I mean, the osmotic pressure is the pressure exerted by the particles on the wall. So whether it's a piston or, I mean, here you have the solvent and you have the particles which are floating around. It's like a gas of uh, ions. So it's a gas of particles and in a container, so it's the osmotic pressure. It's the pressure due to the ions moving in the in the container. It's uh, it's the same. I mean. It's